All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I am excited to introduce our last speaker of this semester. We will uh, keep an eye out uh, in January for our lineup for the spring. Uh, but to get us rolling here, uh, Dr. Martin Selbaum is a professor of psychology at the University of Otago in New Zealand, where he's joining us from now. He received his PhD in clinical psychology from Kent State University, where he also completed a postdoctoral fellowship. But of course, most notably, he received his MA in clinical psychology from Ball State University. He's also the editor at the Journal of Personality Assessment, and his research interests focus broadly on maladaptive manifestations of personality and applied clinical personality assessment. And we're excited to welcome him today to share some of his work with us. So take it away, Martin. All right, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, uh, good morning, everyone, um, or good afternoon, I suppose, to you all. Uh, it is uh, morning here in Dunedin, New Zealand, uh, 8 a.m. Uh, to be specific. Um, uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I am uh, uh, thrilled to be speaking to uh, a Ball State uh, audience. Uh, I uh, I left the department there 20 years ago, so I don't know how much overlap there is now in the audience uh, with when I was there, but, uh, uh, and I can only see a handful of little Zoom screens here on my right. Um, uh, so uh, anyhow, um, so thank you very much for inviting me to do this seminar. Uh, I uh, uh, enjoy speaking about this topic and uh, uh, it's probably something that's a bit less familiar to uh, most in the United States because the ICD-11, which is published by the World Health Organization, uh, tends to be uh, used more frequently outside the U.S. But uh, uh, I think with some of these more uh, recent developments uh, with respect to uh, operationalizing personality disorder, uh, I think the ICD-11 might be of some interest, uh, including to those in the States. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, give a little bit of an introduction to uh, personality disorder um, and uh, uh, in particular uh, talk about the limitations of the current system that is used uh, in the DSM-5 uh, as well as what's used in the ICD-10. Uh, and then I'm going to describe the ICD-11 personality disorder diagnoses. Uh, the bulk of the presentation today is going to be focused on some research uh, into the ICD-11 personality disorder diagnoses that's been conducted primarily here in my lab. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some future directions. So hopefully um, that will be of interest to you. <clears throat> so... Um, personality disorders uh, uh, in the DSM-5, for those of you who are less familiar, um, uh, is defined as an enduring pattern of inner experiences and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the individual's culture. Uh, and this uh, pattern is manifested in the way we think, feel, uh, relate to others and are able to control our behaviors. Some of the key features of personality disorder, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, is that it needs to be inflexible across contexts um, in the sense that someone is not being difficult just at work or at home, but uh, they are having these sorts of issues uh, across different settings. Uh, and that it is quite pervasive, quite domineering of their functioning. Um, it's also this idea that personality disorders are stable, uh, that is, they don't change. Um, we'll talk more about that assumption later. Uh, and of course, it causes some sig significant distress in individual uh, or in other individuals. So that's a general definition of personality disorder. Uh, this sort of definition was also shared of the uh, in the ICD-10, um, uh, uh, which had a fairly similar system to the current DSM-5 uh, with respect to operationalizing personality pathology. Uh, I'm not going to go over these 10 personality disorders, uh, uh, but I do list them here. I'm sure that many of you are familiar. Uh, there are 10 personality disorders in total in DSM-5. Uh, they are organized uh, into three separate clusters or domains, um, which have no real scientific evidence, but they're used nonetheless. 
uh, and uh, the ICD-11, or I'm sorry, ICD-10, had similar sorts of personality disorders. They're not uh, perfectly overlapping, but you see some of the same sorts of names or variants of the names here. Uh, uh, there are two striking differences between the ICD-10 and DSM-5 uh, that uh, has some implications for what I'm going to talk about later, and that's the absence of narcissistic personality disorder. Narcissism has never been viewed as a personality disorder uh, in the ICD in any version, um, and um, we can debate whether or not uh, you know, that should be the fact. Uh, and uh, schizotypal personality disorder uh, is, has never been included among personnel source in the ICD-10 uh, because it's always been viewed as part of the schizophrenia spectrum uh, rather than being viewed as a personality disorder. But beyond that, by and large, uh, uh, there's a great deal of overlap across the DSM-5 and the ICD-10. Um, now, uh, how frequently do these occur? Uh, well, in uh, 2018, uh, Volkert and colleagues uh, uh, published a meta-analysis where they essentially looked at uh, a large number of uh, studies uh, using adult community populations to get a sense of how frequently personality disorders occur. Uh, so across 10 studies with almost 114,000 people, they found that the prevalence rate for at least one personality disorder was about 12%. So that's fairly high. This is in the general community, so not, not in clinical settings. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, chances are that, you know, even um, I see there are about uh, 35 participants uh, in this uh, room. You know, if we're, you see sorts of averages, maybe about three of you would have a personality disorder. Of course, um, you might not be representative of the general community. So let's assume that number is zero. Uh, okay, so um, of course, uh, these estimates vary greatly depending on the sort of sample that was used in survey method. But uh, on average, this is what you tend to find. Uh, looking at the individual personality disorders from the DSM-5, which is what they uh, looked at, uh, uh, we see that uh, the individual disorders, of course, have far less prevalence rates uh, with, with the obsessive compulsive personality disorder being the most frequent in the general community. Um, uh, it's also one that tends to be viewed as the most adaptive personality disorder in the sense that being a workaholic and perfectionist can actually have some good uh, outcomes as well for people. Um, uh, borderline personality disorder uh, is one that clinicians know a lot about. It tends to be the most frequent in clinical context, but not necessarily in uh, the general community. Um, so where do these sorts of things come from? Well, uh, it started out uh, uh, with a psychoanalytic theory, uh, like many other things in, in uh, uh, modern psychiatry and clinical psychology. Um, the uh, DSM and DSM-2 were uh, providing some narrative descriptions of uh, different personality types, um, and uh, uh, they're very much rooted in psychodynamic theory. And, and a lot of these uh, were based on clinical observations that psychiatrists in particular uh, had uh, seen in their patients. So a lot of anecdotal evidence to uh, inform the formation of these sorts of um, uh, disorder categories. And then they just kind of persisted over time, even though there haven't actually been a whole lot of evidence to suggest they're real entities. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, they were there in the DSM-3 and onwards. Uh, uh, there was some general movement towards uh, making uh, uh, mental disorder diagnoses, and not just PDs, but mental disorders in general, uh, a bit more operational and reliable. Uh, so the DSM changed from these sort of narrative descriptions or prototypes uh, into more uh, lists of criteria uh, that tended to be um, uh, mostly uh, polythetic in nature. So if you have like X out of Y symptoms, you would meet um, a threshold for a particular diagnosis. And the personality disorders were no different. Uh, most of the personality disorders that emerged, um, about uh, nine to 12 of them across the various manuals, they usually had seven to nine symptoms. And if you had about half of those, you would meet threshold for a diagnosis. Uh, subsequent research into all of this suggested that the DSM-5 has 
or DSM in general got most things wrong. Uh, a lot of the assumptions that they made about stability of personality pathology, uh, chronicity, uh, degree of separation from other types of mental disorders have not really uh, been supported in subsequent research. Uh, nevertheless, we do know that uh, you know, even with this flawed system of operationalizing personality pathology, uh, the presence of such does have some uh, impacts in, in uh, functioning for people. Uh, Les Moore and colleagues, for instance, uh, suggested that no matter how you operationalize personality disorder using the traditional system or some of the newer versions that I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, it tends to be associated with significant impairment across a number of, of important life domains like occupational functioning, social functioning, um, general distress, and so on. Uh, personality disorders have been associated with worse therapeutic alliance in clinical contexts. Uh, it tends to moderate treatment outcomes of other mental disorders. Uh, also tends to be associated with worse outcomes for general health disorders and are associated with greater economic burden on the, on the health system. Uh, also, personality disorders tend to be associated with greater psychiatric health care utilization. So uh, a lot of important impact. So personality disorders concepts are clinically useful. Uh, it's just that the way that we've conceptualized, operationalized these disorders uh, have not been very good uh, over the past several decades. So there's certainly scope for improvement. And uh, I certainly think that such improvement can have positive impact both on mental health assessment and treatment. So uh, some of you may be thinking, uh, uh, what's the actual problem with the current categorical personality disorder model? Uh, uh, maybe some of you or many of you have not really uh, uh, read about this or, or thought about this uh, so much. Uh, uh, so I'm going to uh, provide a little bit of an overview of some of these problems or limitations, uh, uh, so we're all on the same page. Uh, the number one problem uh, is uh, diagnostic co-occurrence. Uh, so if we look at the personality disorders, they, they have a tremendous amount of symptom overlap, actually. Uh, in this, not sure, I'm not even pressing any buttons here, there's a ghost in my machine. Uh, but if we look at the personality disorders, uh, the uh, 10 uh, in, in columns here using the DSM-5 currently uh, and, and some uh, symptom clusters uh, in the rows here. Uh, the uh, yellow or golden boxes can indicate central or, or, or core symptoms. There seems to be some uh, relative uh, distinction between these disorders. But then if you look at prominent features of each of the personnel disorders, which is uh, indicated by the purple boxes here, uh, you see that there's uh, quite a bit of overlap across uh, these disorders. There are some uh, personality disorders that actually have verbatim uh, symptoms, like they're, they're written exactly uh, verbatim um, across disorders. That is not particularly useful. So what happens then is that if you meet diagnostic threshold for one personality disorder, chances are, in fact, it's more than 50% chance that you're going to meet diagnostic threshold for a second personality disorder or more. So with respect to uh, uh, you know, uh, studying personality disorders, uh, looking at treatment and so on, it's not a particularly useful system uh, if a lot of these personality disorders are gonna overlap. Uh, a second issue is uh, arbitrary and unstable boundaries with normal psychological functioning. The DSM actually never really defines what is normal. Um, and uh, uh, also it tends to be quite arbitrary uh, in the sense that we use these polythetic criterion sets. So we need X out of Y symptoms in order to define what is normal. So many of these are quite arbitrary. In fact, uh, I remember speaking to Bob Kruger, who was on the DSM-5 personality disorder work group. Uh, and I asked him, where does this come from? Why five out of nine for borderline personality disorder, for instance? And, and uh, you know, it, it, it goes back to previous uh, committees uh, for DSM-3 and DSM-4, who pretty much suggest, well, about half sounds about right. Uh, so no scientific evidence to suggest that these are some natural thresholds that move us from uh, normality, uh, what is even normal to begin with, but uh, I guess healthy functioning to dysfunction, but rather uh, about half sounds about right. So uh, 
that's somewhat intellectually embarrassing for our field, not to mention fiscally irresponsible, given how many millions of dollars they go into epidemiological studies to look at the prevalence rates of about half sounds about right. Anyhow, I'll get off that soapbox. Um, and uh, just also talk a little bit about the problem with these uh, polythetic uh, uh, thresholds beyond just the fact that they're arbitrary. So one study that was uh, published uh, about a decade ago, more than that now by Cooper and colleagues, uh, used an item response uh, theory model uh, to look at severity of, of uh, various combinations of symptoms. So here they looked at borderline personality disorder, uh, which has uh, nine symptoms in total. You need five out of those nine in order to meet diagnostic threshold. But what they show that it depends on what sort of combination of symptoms that you actually have, because if we look at the uh, uh, x-axis here, which is essentially symptom severity, uh, then uh, different combinations of, say, five symptoms are going to be associated with a wide range of different severity levels in functioning. And in fact, um, uh, some combinations of four symptoms are associated with higher severity level than five symptoms that, of course, you need to meet threshold for diagnosis. Um, so nothing magical really happens when you move from four to five symptoms. And in fact, again, you can have people with four symptoms who are more severe than people who have five symptoms. So these uh, polythetic criterion sets are not particularly useful uh, in, uh, to, to indicate some form of magical movement uh, from, from being healthy to being dysfunctional. There's also excessive within diagnosis heterogeneity across patients. Again, if we use polythetic criterion sets like X out of Y, there's going to be a number of different combinations uh, for meeting disorder criteria. So again, to pick on borderline personality disorder, uh, there, uh, if you need five out of nine, uh, there's actually 256 different combinations of meeting threshold for that uh, disorder. Uh, even worse, if you look at antisocial personality disorder, you need three out of seven, or obsessive compulsive personality disorder, you need four out of eight. So for those two diagnoses, you can have two patients who, who have the same disorder who do not share a single symptom, uh, which is also not particularly useful. Uh, there's also inadequate coverage of personality disorder. You'd think that if you have 10 categories, you'd cover all of personality pathology, but a lot of research has suggested that this old category of not otherwise specified um, uh, seems to dominate the picture, at least in the clinical field, uh, where there's a large number of, of patients who meet uh, criteria for general personality disorder, but do not neatly fit into any of these 10 categories. So they get a personality disorder not otherwise specified uh, uh, instead. I know that term comes from DSM-4 rather than DSM-5. Uh, marked temporal instability. So the idea that these are stable chronic uh, syndromes uh, have not really been borne out in reality. I'll pick on borderline personality disorder again. Uh, so Gunderson and colleagues used data from the CLIP study, the collaborative, collaborative longitudinal uh, study for personality, uh, and uh, studied 175 patients with borderline personality disorder. The met diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder uh, at the time of initial assessment and then studied them 10 years later. And what you find without any form of intervention is that the nine symptoms of borderline personality disorder were, were uh, just um, naturally remitting over time. So this idea that these symptoms are chronic and will remain the same without any form of treatment simply is not true. Um, also, you know, this whole idea that you have these uh, criteria that make up 10 personality disorders um, uh, do not really conform to scientific reality. Uh, if you do any form of factor analysis or attempt some form of cluster or latent class analysis using these, these criteria, you're never going to find uh, the 10 uh, personality disorders. There's not been a single study that I have read that have tried to do this that found support for these 10 personality disorder categories. So there's not a whole lot of empirical evidence to suggest that these uh, old clinical observations actually exist. 
And then finally, it's the inadequate scientific base for the personality disorders. It's only three of the DSM-5 personality disorders that have any uh, substantive research base with respect to etiology and treatment that would be antisocial, borderline, and schizotypal personality disorders. Uh, some people think narcissism has a lot of research behind it. Uh, it does when you think about it as a more uh, normative personality construct. There's quite little amount of research on narcissistic personality disorder as it's defined in the DSM-5. Part of the reason is that, of course, people with narcissistic PD do not tend to show up in our clinics and therefore not make themselves available for study. I guess if you meet diagnostic threshold for narcissism, uh, you don't think anything is wrong with you because you're superior to other people. Uh, so how do we fix this? Well, uh, uh, this is not necessarily my solution. Uh, this, uh, this is a solution that's been proposed uh, over uh, decades now. Um, uh, but that is to uh, include personality, actual personality, uh, better into the definition of personality disorder. So rather than using these arbitrary symptom sets, maybe we should look at personality as it exists in everyone uh, and uh, look at uh, individual differences, personality traits. And when these sorts of traits exist in extreme in individuals and it leads to some form of dysfunction, that's when we start talking about disorder. And it doesn't really matter what sort of personality model is your favorite. And I know uh, that uh, some don't even believe in personality. That's a different debate. For now, we have to assume that it's true that personality is useful. Uh, if you look at any type of model, like the five-factor model of personality, for instance, like neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, et cetera, uh, you know, these sorts of traits exist in everyone, uh, but in differing degrees. So when you are at the extreme of these sorts of traits and have some form of problems associated with that, that's when you can start talking about disorder. And there's an analogy to this already in the DSM-5, and that's called intellectual disability. Um, uh, here we're looking at an individual differences construct that's normally distributed in the general population, and that is intelligence. But when intelligence is extremely low, which at least traditionally was defined as two standard deviations above the normative or below the normative main, and that results in some deficits in adaptive functioning, that's when you have a disorder that we call intellectual disability. Why can't you do the same with personality disorders is what a lot of people have argued. And in fact, that's kind of where we're headed. So uh, I'm going to uh, um, uh, skip through some things, but I just want to illustrate this uh, a little bit more quickly. So uh, what, uh, how dimensional models of personality uh, disorders are being defined is according to two broad dimensions, if you will, of, of severity uh, in functioning, which is analogous to impairment, and style, which is really the description of, of what's going on. And we can think about this uh, using some examples here. You, you can look at these houses here, um, and you can think to yourself, uh, usually I ask for some audience participation, but it's a little bit less um, um, feasible via Zoom. Uh, you can imagine, you know, these houses here, which of these houses would you like to live in? Uh, would you prefer any of these houses to your current house, for instance, and uh, assuming all things are equal? Uh, and uh, th there's, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of preference for, for uh, one of these houses because, you know, they're, they're fancy houses. They probably cost a lot of money. They're probably quite um, uh, luxurious and so on. Uh, uh, so there would be quite high on the severity end with respect to uh, to cost and, and uh, desirability. Uh, but there would still be individual differences in the sort of house that, uh, that uh, you'd prefer. Some, some would like to live in a lavish mansion, uh, whereas others would prefer to live more in solitude out in the woods in some very fancy cabin with a lake, uh, whereas others would, again, prefer the more modern looking sort of house. So point here being that even though we're looking at things that are a higher end of the severity scale, here being cost and and desirability, there will still be individual differences in how this would be manifested. Similarly, we can look at musicians here. Uh, hopefully, you recognize most of these people. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, th these are uh, famous musicians, all making a lot of money, 
uh, probably still some individual differences in how much money, but there still would be a higher end of the severity scale. But there's still quite dramatic individual differences with respect to the sort of music that they produce and what sort of music that, that people would desire. So the way that this severity manifests would be uh, quite different. Uh, and um, the same sort of thing could be applied to uh, personality pathology, where some researchers like uh, Aidan Wright and colleagues, for instance, they use this uh, CLIP study again, the Collaborative Longitudinal Study for Personality Disorder, uh, and they uh, did a model where they estimated a general personality dysfunction domain out of all 10 personality disorders in the DSM. Uh, and also looked at some orthogonal factors that would represent different types of personality style. So the idea here is that impairment can be separated uh, from style. And in fact, when you do so, you're getting some uh, general trait domains that are actually quite similar to the sorts of domains that you would see in, say, the five-factor model personality and other uh, sorts of personality models. Uh, and in fact, when you look at this over time, you do see that some of these personality domains are actually quite stable over time for the most part, but it's the general personality dysfunction that seems to change over time. So less impairment, less distress, that's regressing, to, regressing towards the main, whereas the uh, general style uh, or personality traits seems to be a bit more stable. Uh, so in terms of dimension models of personality disorder in the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, skip through some of these points, but it doesn't really matter what sort of model we use. Uh, early on, there used to be people uh, proposing the five-factor model personality, the very popular model personality, and the general personality psychology domain, <clears throat> certainly well-researched. And looking at the extremes of those could be viewed to, to conceptualize PD. But there's been some, some pushback against this model because it's viewed as too normative or perhaps too healthy, for lack of better words. Uh, so that led to the development of the alternative model personality disorders, uh, which looks at uh, personality impairment as well as personality style. Um, so with respect to impairment in functioning, look at things like self-regulation, identity, uh, whereas for uh, interpersonal functioning, they look at things like ability to relate to others, take other people's perspective, form attachments to others, and so on. So if you're not functioning appropriately in those sorts of domains, you may, would qualify for a disorder. But personality traits would be used to describe what that personality disorder looks like. The DSM-5 still attempted to map the uh, different combinations of traits and impairment onto six personality disorder categories. But I think that was uh, a little bit trying a little bit too hard uh, because, again, assumes that those categories are valid to begin with. So by interest of time, I'm just going to you know, skip through this. Uh, the, the trait model is quite different from DSM-5 uh, uh, compared to, the, say, the five-factor model in the sense that it's a lot more dysfunctional in nature and has this psychoticism domain. Uh, but... Um, uh, yeah, anyhow, I'm going to skip to ICD-11 personnel disorder that's built on the same sort of concepts. So uh, the ICD-11 personality disorder system, um, the ICD was formally published in 2018, uh, but then it needed to be approved by all of the member states of the World Health Organization. This happened in 2019, and formal implementation by the member states which I believe the United States is still a WHO member, even though I think Donald Trump was trying to extract the states from the World Health Organization, uh, one of his many brilliant ideas. Um, I, I'm being sarcastic. But anyhow, um, I believe the states are still remain a member. Uh, so uh, this is supposed to be the formal uh, mechanism of coding a mental disorders, uh, uh, at least in psychiatry. Um, but it's become a lot more popular uh, outside of the U.S. because, of course, the DSM-5 is published by the American Psychiatric Association, uh, so that uh, which is, of course, highly influenced by insurance companies in the States. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot of power there that's um, resisting change, whereas uh, the World Health Organization does not, at least to the same degree, have those degree of influences. Uh, so the ICD-11 has completely changed the personality disorder diagnoses uh, from uh, these uh, categories uh, that we've talked about to a more dimensional disorder that's analogous to this idea of impairment versus 
personality traits or style that I have been talking about. Uh, so the personality disorder in itself is solely defined by impairment in function. Uh, so uh, there's only one personality disorder diagnosis. Uh, and it's characterized by problems in functioning and the aspect of the self, as well as how we relate to other people. And I'm not going to read all of this. And it uh, manifests in a, a number of different ways, including, again, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we express our emotions, regulate our emotions, and behaviors that are maladaptive for us. Uh, and the disturbance is not developmentally appropriate, cannot be explained primarily by social cultural factors, um, including social political conflict. Uh, which is relevant in many other countries. Uh, uh, so the uh, w, uh, WHO, of course, member states uh, saturates the entire world, not just North America. So we have to keep other contexts in mind as well. Associated with substantial distress or significant impairment in a variety of domains of functioning. Uh, and of course, the more severity, the more domains are affected. So personality disorder is uh, very much defined according to severity gradient, uh, moving from no disorder to personality difficulty. So you can code personality difficulty, which is not a formal disorder, but can still highlight that this person might have some personality related issues that clinicians should be aware of. To the formal personality disorder diagnoses, they're mild, moderate, and severe, which essentially tends to refer to the degree of intensity of the of the impairment as well as the pervasiveness of impairment. So without going through all of these in details, that is you know, how the, the severity dimension tends to work. Uh, but also the ICD-11 allows to, to code prominent personality traits or patterns. It's not required. So you can actually assign a personality disorder diagnosis without talking about traits. But I think clinically, the traits add some utility because they can be used to actually describe the personality of the individual that you're diagnosing with a personality disorder. So these trait domain qualifiers, which are individual differences traits, uh, can be used to characterize the personality pathology. There are five of them in, in uh, uh, more specifically negative affectivity, uh, detachment, which is more pathological variant of introversion, dissociality, which is called antagonism in the DSM-5 alternative personality disorder model, disinhibition, and an encastia, uh, which I think most of us would use the word compulsivity um, uh, to characterize that domain. In addition, there's a borderline personality pattern. Uh, this is where politics uh, uh, take over uh, science. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, countries that do have insurance schemes that pay for the treatment of borderline personality disorder, but no other personality disorders. So uh, there was a lot of fear that if they got rid of borderline from this uh, diagnosis, would be lots of patients who would no longer receive coverage for treatment. Uh, this is particularly the case in Germany. Uh, and Germany has a lot of influence um, in the psychiatry outside of the states. Uh, so they managed to kind of sneak this in. Um, it's, uh, it's terrible for science, but you know what? I don't care. Uh, if the field moves uh, from all these uh, problematic categories to a more dimensional system like they have, uh, people can, can uh, have their borderline pattern for all I care, because this is a step in the right direction uh, as, insofar as I'm concerned. So uh, I'm going to spend, uh, I thought I was going to spend the bulk of the time on this. Uh, uh, clearly, my problems with time management is, uh, is manifesting here. Uh, I don't think that is part of the five traits I listed. So maybe, you know, hopefully I don't have a personality disorder. But nevertheless, I do clearly have a time management problem. Uh, uh, I do still want to highlight some important research findings. Uh, most of these are going to come from my lab. Um, uh, because I think you guys might care about that sort of stuff, but also because the ICD-11 PD is quite new and a lot of the research on this is actually coming from my lab. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to uh, look at, and, and a lot of this is uh, driven by my PhD student, Tiffany Brown, uh, whose name is going to occur across these, is, is this a personality disorder diagnosis valid? So we just got, this is... Uh, just came out online, um, a paper in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry, 
where we looked at the validity of clinician ratings uh, of ICD-11 personality disorder. And we only focus on the severity rating that we just talked about, no disorder, difficulty, mild, moderate, severe. Uh, and we're, we're interested in, uh, in uh, whether or not uh, uh, these clinical ratings would be associated with other uh, things that it should be associated with, you know, basic concept of validity. Uh, uh, over the past three years, we've been collecting data uh, from um, uh, people in community mental health uh, uh, here in Dunedin, uh, or Otipati Aotearoa, which is the Te Reo Maori uh, name for Dunedin, New Zealand. Uh, and uh, this is a community mental health sample that's fairly representative of what you would see in community mental health, two-thirds female, uh, largest ethnic groups uh, are New Zealand European or white people uh, or Pakeha. Um, 14% uh, are Maori, which is the indigenous population of New Zealand, uh, which is slightly higher than what you would see uh, on the South Island of New Zealand, where that rate is about 7%. It's about 17% overall across the country. 13% uh, other European, so people who uh, have direct uh, descendants from other uh, countries, like, say, even Australia, uh, the UK, uh, United States, uh, other uh, European countries or European uh, descendant countries. Uh, anyhow, it was a highly internalizing sample in the sense that a lot of these people were being treated for depression, anxiety, and those sorts of things. And surprisingly, and we did not advertise for this at all, we advertised for people or mental health treatment, period. 55% met diagnostic criteria for ICD-11 personality disorder, which is quite consistent with studies that Mark Zimmerman did about 15 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, where they found that 50% uh, of inpatients in psychiatric hospitals in the United States met diagnostic criteria for at least one personality disorder. It's just that it tends to be grossly underdiagnosed. And this is highly uh, reliable. So my uh, well-trained uh, clinical research assistants uh, had an intra-class correlation coefficient of 0.96 uh, with respect to uh, reliability of this diagnosis. Uh, you can see here the distribution. Uh, so only 15% had no disorder at all, almost 30% had difficulty, and then we see mild, moderate, severe in the sort of frequencies that we would expect, where far more have mild than the other two. Uh, looking at associations with uh, self-report, um, so our clinicians' ratings uh, associated with self-ratings of, of various uh, personality impairment. So here we're using the level of personality functioning, uh, which is uh, analogous to the DSM-5 impairment domains, seeing fairly high correlations. Again, this, these do not share method variants, so these are pretty high correlations, moderate to large correlations, and correlations with informants. So these are lay people, uh, people who did not know, uh, well, they knew that the, uh, uh, the uh, participants because they were related to them or friends of them, but they were not clinically trained. So looking at lay informants views of personality impairment uh, in the participants, they were moderately uh, correlated as well with clinician ratings of personality uh, disorder. Similarly, looking at the traditional personality disorder categories, found mostly moderate correlations with self and informant ratings uh, in that respect. So overall, this, uh, and we present a lot more in that paper, but I just don't have time to go over every single finding. So overall, that uh, shows some promising evidence for the validity uh, of a clinician-generated uh, uh, ICD-11 personality disorder diagnosis, and uh, clinicians and researchers can have some good confidence uh, uh, to apply this disorder in practice. So of course, this is just one study in one context. These findings need to be replicated. Now, um, uh, what um, uh, we also try to do is look at some standardized assessment of severity, because what I uh, looked at in the initial study, or we looked at in the initial study, were more semi-standardized, at best, clinician ratings of ICD-11. What about more standardized measurement, like psychometric measures, like self-report questionnaires, for instance? Well, there's no official measure for the ICD-11 PD, unlike what was being developed for the DSM-5 when they were trying to propose a similar uh, model that ended up being an alternative model. Uh, there was a measure called a standardized assessment of severity of personality disorder, the SAS-PD, that was developed 
uh, but it was based on an earlier draft of the ICD-11 PD model that changed substantially. And this measure has had some significant psychometric problems as well that have been well published. Uh, so it's not a great candidate. Also, some people have suggested, well, the DSM-5 alternative model for personality disorders and the ICD-11 are quite similar. Maybe we can just use an, a DSM-5 measure for this purpose. And they could be decent proxies, but they're still not going to have great content validity because there are important differences in terms of how the DSM-5 alternative model in the ICD-11 defines severity. So that led uh, my colleagues and I to develop a new measure, the Personality Disorder Severity Scale, or the PDS-ICD-11. Uh, Bo Bach is a close colleague of mine who, is, uh, who works in Denmark, uh, and uh, he collaborated with, with my lab as well as uh, uh, some prominent psychiatrists from New Zealand, Roger Mulder and Giles Newton House, who were both on the ICD-11 uh, Personality Disorder uh, Committee. Uh, so they had a lot of insight into this process. And Eric Siemensen, who is a Danish psychiatrist who um, uh, has been part of the personality disorder field for a very long time. So we developed a new measure. And, and a part of the goal of this measure was to improve content validity in measurement. So we wanted to ensure that every aspect of the definition of personality disorder severity in the ICD-11 was, was covered by our measure. So without going into a great amount of detail, we developed items that would focus on these different types of domains uh, that were covered in the most recent draft published by the World Health Organization uh, uh, defining personality disorder. And it led to a 14 uh, item measure. And one of the innovations associated with this was that we, for, uh, for 10 of these items, we used bipolar rating scales. And what I mean by that is that a lot of these indices of impairment can go in either direction. Self-worth is a good example. You can be impaired in the area of self-worth, uh, both because you feel poorly about yourself and that that affects how you relate to other people, or you feel superior to other people. And that also affects your functioning in relations with others. So you can go in either way. And we identified that 10 of these 14 items would actually work quite well on a bipolar scale. So we would essentially uh, give points depending on the direction. So if it was a mild form of impairment, it got a point of one regardless of direction. And if it was more moderate, severe impairment, we got a point of two, again, regardless of direction. And this seems to work quite well. Some of these items like harm to self, harm to others, uh, were better articulated on a unipolar scale. Uh, and what we did is uh, we collect a large amount of data from a community sample actually representative of the United States because it was cheaper uh, and because uh, there are more people uh, and uh, found that if we just uh, uh, do a unidimensional confirmatory factor analysis, so see we good fit, uh, uh, high factor loadings across the board, if you uh, estimate an item response theory model, uh, we find that um, uh, there, each of the items provided good, reliable information um, uh, in the assessment of this underlying construct. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with IRT, I apologize, but I don't have time to really go over it. Uh, uh, but what this essentially means is also that uh, the sort of severity that you need uh, 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 in terms of personality pathology um, uh, is quite high across the board. Uh, in, uh, for, for endorsing some of these items, the mild or moderate range, which is expected in a community population. And in fact, uh, and the reliability, by the way, was quite high for this measure. Um, so if you look at the overall test information function, again, this is based on IRT, on the y-axis, we're looking essentially at severity, uh, and this is expressed in z-scores. Uh, we find that the most information uh, for the assessment of PD is about the average to two to three standard deviations above the mean. Well, for, for a general community sample, that's exactly what we want. Uh, we want the measure to work optimally 
uh, in the area that would be deviant uh, with respect to functioning and particularly in the higher domains. We don't really care that much about people who are below average with respect to personality disorder severity. We care about people who are above average. And that is the, where we get the most reliable information for the scale. But we also did some, uh, some analysis to determine what would be an optimal cut score. So we look at two standard deviations above the mean that would correspond to an estimated score of 17 and a half. Um, also found some good evidence for validity uh, and it worked better than the SAS PD, but I don't have time to say much more than that. Um, uh, we also replicated these findings in this community mental health sample. Uh, Tiffany has submitted this paper for publication as part of her PhD thesis. Uh, and uh, again, uh, found that uh, the, this PDS-11, uh, uh, ICD-11 is correlating quite highly uh, with clinician ratings um, uh, in these various uh, impairment domains. Um, keep in mind that this is a self-report questionnaire correlating with clinician ratings. So there's no shared method variance here at all. So these are quite large correlations with respect to how they view themselves versus how clinicians view them. Uh, and of course, correlating highly with self-report questionnaires of, of impairment as well, including with the SAS-PD. Uh, we found that we can differentiate uh, people quite well who have been diagnosed by, by clinicians as having ICD-11 personality disorder versus not. And in fact, if we look at, at um, the increasing degrees of severity in personality pathology, here we had to combine moderate and severe personality disorder because of sample size. We find, as we expect, higher scores on the PDS ICD-11 uh, with greater degrees of personality pathology. Um, so uh, the PDS ICD-11 seems to be a good promising measure in the interest of time. That's all I will say. That cut score I proposed uh, earlier is probably too high. Uh, so we need more uh, than that. What about the trait domain specifiers? Well, um, there's been a lot of research looking at the uh, five trait domains. Uh, I had a lot of things to say here in the interest of time. I'm going to skip most of it. But what I do want to say is that it started out using the personality inventory for DSM-5, which of course was developed for the DSM-5. And we're finding some good um, uh, potential uh, way of estimating uh, ICD-11 traits that way. But we discovered that uh, especially this Anacastia domain, which is measures central compulsivity, was not well represented in the PID-5. So we uh, so really needed new other uh, measures. And uh, some new measures have been recently developed. Uh, Josh Oltmans and Tom Whitger developed the personality inventory for ICD-11. Um, uh, Bo Bach and uh, lots of colleagues, myself included, uh, developed a much shorter version of the PID-5 uh, that would uh, do better at capturing all of the ICD-11 domains. Uh, there's a short version, uh, the PAC-11, the personality assessment questionnaire uh, for ICD-11, 17 items. It's not that great, uh, that's spoiler alert. And um, I collect some data, uh, uh, look, I did a exploratory um, uh, SEM model <clears throat> to see are these uh, different domain scales from these different measures converging with one another multivariate space. And by and large, they seem to do. So the negative affectivity measures cluster together, the detachment measures, the dissociality measures and the anacastia measures, but the disinhibition domain is a big mess. So these, this means that these different scales seem to be assessing disinhibition um, quite differently in a manner that does not converge very well. So uh, we need to be wary of that in equating uh, the disinhibition domain scales across these measures as being the same. Uh, so that's a bit of a problem. But what about clinician ratings? So this is the last study I'll talk about. Um, uh, again, this is something that we're preparing for publication using the same community sample. So we estimated a multi-trait, multi-method matrix model uh, because we had, uh, the, uh, we had assessed ICD-11 personality traits three different ways using clinician ratings, self-report, and informant reports. So that allowed us to estimate the hierarchical confirmatory factor analysis model, which looked at something like this, where we could assess uh, the five trait domains because we have three indicators for each. 
but at the same time controlling for method variance because all of these uh, indicators came from clinician ratings, self-report, and informant report. And we're able to do so quite well and estimate the hierarchical model that um, uh, fit the data quite nicely uh, in our clinical sample and found that in doing so, there's quite high associations with latent constructs uh, that are estimating each of these five trait domains. Um, and this is quite promising when you control for method variance. The only thing that we did find here is that the anacastia domain and the disinhibition domain were quite highly correlated, 0.85. So, and this is controlling for both met method variance and random measurement error, suggesting that maybe anacastia and disinhibition are just polar opposites on the same domain. And that is something that we need to consider in our conceptualization of these models. But the key issue here is that no matter we're using clinician, informant, or self-report, there are uh, clearly uh, seem to be associated with the same sort of latent constructs in multivariate space, which is quite important. So uh, <clears throat> in terms of overall summary, I know I'm stealing a lot of time for Q&A here. Um, uh, we see that uh, ICD-11 personnel source severity can be reliably estimated. Um, and of course, we need to be able to measure these things well, um, uh, especially using brief measures, because there uh, many countries uh, lack resources to do full-blown clinical assessments like you might in the United States. Uh, so uh, I, th I think it's all looking quite promising that we, we have access to these short tools that can provide good, valid assessments. So, but we, we do need to look at some future directions. One of the key issues is clinical utility. Um, one of the big arguments against dimensional models is that they're not useful, um, but uh, that doesn't seem to be true. If you ask clinicians, and we've done so as well here in New Zealand, Bo Box Lab looked at Danish clinicians uh, who must use ICD-11. Denmark, you must code according to ICD-11. There's no, no options to use DSM-5. Uh, uh, clinicians seem to prefer ICD-11 uh, to the traditional disorder categories when they're thinking about their patients. We need to see that these things predict patient outcomes in a variety of domains, including clinical, social, and functional domains, um, uh, including treatment response uh, and, and things like that. Uh, we, of course, need to come up with an efficient method of communication. One of the good things about the traditional system is that you have a disorder label, so that's easy to communicate. It's easy to say this person has borderline personality disorder, and that conjures up an idea what that might mean for that patient, even though there are 256 different ways that you could mean something. It still is an easy way of communication because we tend to think about all of those sorts of traits. Uh, PD severity is pretty easy. It's easy to say someone has moderate dysfunction or severe dysfunction, but it's too broad to be informative. We really need to articulate the person's um, uh, functioning through traits. And that's where really where formulation comes into play. And I think clinical psychologists in particular, perhaps more so than psychiatrists, tend to think about their patients with respect to formulation rather than uh, arbitrary diagnoses anyways. So I think this can be quite useful. We need to develop intervention models. Uh, we know that there are no good interventions for any of the traditional personality disorders other than perhaps borderline personality disorder. So those other nine are not particularly useful anyways. So we need to look at developing interventions for these alternative systems, these dimensional systems that focus differently on addressing dysfunction or impairment versus personality style, because I think very different sorts of techniques are going to be necessary to, to treat, say, disinhibition from general distress. So, uh, and Chris Hopwood uh, it produced a very much theoretical articles about how one could go about doing this. He didn't present any empirical evidence because this sort of system is too new, uh, but he talked about the idea of separating uh, different techniques of psychotherapy and addressing uh, impairment versus personality uh, traits. So I think that's all I will really say um, and uh, acknowledge some people, including my PhD student, Tiffany Brown. I have other students, but she's been particularly instrumental in some of this work that we've been doing on the ICD-11. Uh, lots of collaborators, uh, clinical research assistants, and uh, also been fortunate that people have actually chosen to pay for this sort of research. So we've been able to collect some important data in that way.
So I know I stole a lot of time for Q&A, but um, uh, I still think we have about five minutes 